Good morning. Good to see each of you here today. A special word of welcome to those who are visiting with us. I know a number of you are here today because of the choir concert at the Bible College. And uh, my wife said it was uh, really good. She went on Friday evening. I went home and laid down. My back was uh, giving me fits by that time of the day. Um, but uh, she said it was, it was wonderful. So those of you who um, have yet to attend or plan to attend this afternoon, I know that you'll have, a, you'll have a good time. Justin and Katie have announcements they want to make. I'll call on them to begin the, the announcements time. Ladies first, is that what he said? Yeah. Uh, make an announcement about uh, the Grace Choir. We are going to start rehearsals uh, this coming Wednesday and the next Wednesday after the Advent service. And that is for teens and youth, or uh, teens and adults, to sing a song for the Christmas program, which is on December 17th at 6 p.m. So if you're interested, please come. Andrew Hansen is directing or conducting again. So that'll be this Wednesday after the Advent service and next Wednesday. We would like to invite you downstairs for a time of uh, dinner. I think there is, rumor has it, that Wayne Flown has brought some brisket. So if you're going to get some brisket, you might want to go down there lickety-split. So we invite everybody down. Even if you didn't bring a dish, uh, come down. Uh, and uh, the, the, the phrase we're looking at right now is kingdom fellowship. We'd like to do it about every month. But if you have a catchier name than that, uh, I'm just trying that out on you. You can let me know if you have any feedback. Thanks. Does anybody else have an announcement? Okay. Just a reminder then that on Wednesday evening we'll continue our Advent services. This week Pastor Earl Coronan will be speaking. Uh, he'll, his focus is on Jacob, uh, a journey of grace as we continue our Advent journeys. And you see Saturday morning the WMF brunch at Karen Flohn's house uh, and then uh, Sunday school and confirmation um, at their new regular schedule next Sunday morning. If there are no other announcements to make, we'll ask the worship team, or excuse me, we'll ask uh, the Ben Flown family to come and light the first Advent candle for us and give explanation. Then the praise team will come, or the worship team. God is faithful and will keep his promises to to us. Our hope comes from God. And again, Isaiah says, the root of Jesse will spring up, one who will rise to rule over all the nations. The Gentiles will hope in him. May the God of hope fill you with all joy and peace as you trust in him, so that you may overflow with hope by the power of the Holy Spirit. Romans 15, 12 through 13. As we light this candle, let us remember that we are waiting for the birth of Jesus, the King, Promised by God. Romans 13, 11 through 14. Hebrews 1 through 2. Celebrate this morning um, with that hope that Jesus has come to be our Savior and our, um, our King. 
And so I'd ask you to rise with us as we worship his name this morning. God will give to him the throne of his father David, and he will reign over the house of Jacob forever, and of his kingdom there will be no end.
you may be seated. As we come before our God this morning, as we confess you alone are worthy, let us also at this time then confess our sins to him. The confession of sin is found in the bulletin. Heavenly Father, we rejoice in the coming of your Son, Jesus Christ, to live, suffer, and die for our sins. We know that we cannot have eternal life without his costly sacrifice. We thank you that he became our sacrificial lamb so that we might have the forgiveness of sins and eternal life. We believe your word, which tells us that there is therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, the Lord. Forgive us and cleanse us from all our sins and help us in all of our words, thoughts, and deeds to honor you and your sacrifice that was given for us. In the name of Jesus, our Lord. Amen. The scripture lessons are both from the Old Testament uh, this Sunday, and both of them are from the book of Jeremiah. We begin in Cher Jeremiah chapter 34 and read verses uh, 14 through 18. At the end of seven years, each of you must set the fellow Hebrew who has been sold to you and served you six years. You must set him free from all your service. But your fathers did not listen to me or incline their ears to me. You recently repented and did what was right in my eyes by proclaiming liberty each to his neighbor. And you made a covenant before me in the house that is called by my name. But then, but then you turned around and profaned my name when each of you took, uh, took back his male and female slaves whom you had set free according to their desire. And you brought them into subjection to, you, to be your slaves. Therefore, says the Lord, you have not obeyed me by proclaiming liberty. Everyone is to his brother and to his neighbor. Behold, I proclaim to you liberty, to the sword, to pestilence, to, the, to famine, declares the Lord. I will make you a horror to all the kingdoms on the earth. And the men who transgressed my covenant and did not keep the terms of the covenant that they made before me, I will make them like the calf that they cut in two and passed between its parts." The second lesson from Isaiah is from Isaiah 31, and we read verses uh, 31 through 34. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and the house of Judah, not like the covenant that I made with their fathers on the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. My covenant that they broke, though I was their husband, declares the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel after those days, declares the Lord. I will put my law within them and I will write it on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. And no longer shall each one teach his neighbor and uh, each his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for they shall all know me. From the least of them to the greatest, declares the Lord. For I will forgive their iniquity, and I will remember their sin no more. I'll ask that you stand, please, as we confess our faith. We'll use the words of the Nicene Creed. It's also in your bulletin this morning. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and of all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, 
by whom all things were made, who for us and for our salvation came down from heaven and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit, the Virgin Mary, and was made man, and was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. And the third day he rose again according to the scriptures. He ascended into heaven and is seated on the right hand of the Father, and he shall come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom shall have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord, giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets, and I believe one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins, and I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. And we'll ask the ushers to wait on you for the offering this morning. And during the offering, uh, Gwen Berge, Dulcie Winkleman, and Heidi Johnson will provide special music.
we'll ask that you uh, sing along, uh, Oh, How Shall I Receive Thee? Let's stand together. Oh, how shall I receive thee? How great thee, Lord, aright. All nations long to see thee. My hope, my heart's delight. Oh, candle, Lord, most holy, thy lamp with Please be seated. The gospel lesson for this first Sunday in Advent is uh, found in Luke chapter 4, verses 16 through 22. Luke 4, 16 through 22. He, Jesus, went to Nazareth where he had been brought up, and on the Sabbath day he went into the synagogue as was his custom. And he stood up to read. The scroll of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. Unrolling it, he found the place where it is written, The Spirit of the Lord is on me, because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he rolled up the scroll, gave it back to the attendant, and sat down. The eyes of everyone in the synagogue were fastened on him. And he began by saying to them, Today this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. All spoke well of him and were amazed at the gracious words that came from his lips. Isn't this Joseph's son, they asked? Now, you may have noticed the same title for my message as the title for the hymn we just sang. That's not a typo. I think it's an appropriate title for the text 
uh, of, of the message or the text before us this morning. And, and uh, I, I want to share with you a, a couple of reasons why I, I, think, I think it's a good title. Today marks the first Sunday in a short season of the church here known as Advent, and we were instructed already that the word Advent means coming. Now this season comes at a very hectic time of the year when most of us are busy making preparations for what has commonly come to be known as the holidays. And I, you know, I, I wonder about that. This is kind of one of those what came first, the chicken or the egg type of thing. Because if we truly were celebrating Christmas, I don't think it would be nearly so hectic as it's become. But unfortunately, we've kind of been sucked into the notion that we have to buy big gifts for everybody and we've got to get several for every person and we've got to decorate, you know, not one tree, but three or four. And we've got to go outside and risk limb and life to get the houses decorated. And uh, yeah, it. It gets crazy, doesn't it? Well, I, I think that if we really observe Advent in the church, it can help us to make a proper preparation, a preparation within, a preparation of the heart, so that we can truly, rightly celebrate the Christ child who came to us now over 2,000 years ago. The Advent season is about receiving Christ as he comes to us. And it seems to me that the most appropriate question we could ask during this season is, how shall I receive you? How shall I receive you? Secondly, as we consider Jesus' visit to his hometown of Nazareth, we should see him received by the townspeople, but we should also see that their reception of Jesus was for all the wrong reasons. Jesus very clearly pointed that fact out to him or to them. And in fact, they took great offense at Jesus' corrective. The gospel text for this first Sunday in Advent then is one which concerns itself with the answer again to that most basic, appropriate of all Advent questions. How shall I receive you? How shall I receive thee? Well, let me tell you what we cannot do. We cannot receive him on our own terms. That's what the townsfolk of Nazareth did or attempted. And you see, it's a fatal mistake to do so. Now, let me set a little context here historically. In Luke chapter 4, verses 13 through 15 comprise a one-year period. After Jesus' baptism, he went out and ministered to the people. And we read, when the devil had finished all his tempting, he left them until an opportune time. Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through the whole countryside. He taught in their synagogues, and everyone praised him. Then, verse 16, comes a year after those verses, a year after the baptism of Jesus. Jesus goes to Nazareth, where he'd been brought up. And on the Sabbath day, he went into the synagogue, as was his custom, and he stood up to read. Standing up was an indication that you wanted to read from the scriptures. Now, Luke places this account in his gospel in order to emphasize, I think, the opposition that Jesus encountered throughout his ministry. Yes, he was popular among the masses, but among the leadership, he wasn't popular at all. Not at all. And that reluctance to receive him and that hatred, that rejection of him only grew throughout his three and a half year ministry. Now, what was wrong uh, with, with the reception of the people of Nazareth? Well, first of all, it was based on prejudice. You notice they say, isn't this Joseph's boy? That's their prejudice. This is the little guy who grew up down the street. I remember him carrying a mallet with his dad when they went to the carpenter shop, you know, that kind of a thing. This is Joseph's boy. And yet at the same time, they knew the stories about him that were making their way around the country. This Joseph's boy 
was doing some remarkable things. And I think they also had the wrong expectation of what Jesus would do for them. I think they approached him selfishly, in other words. Jesus, we're told, went to the synagogue on the Sabbath, as was his custom. Jesus would not and could not change his plans, his modus operandi for them. I think they may have preferred to just have, you know, forget Sabbath worship, let's meet outside and let Jesus entertain us. He'll give us his best tricks. <laughs> Jesus instead asked for the scroll, scroll to be given to him from the prophet Isaiah. He found and read the text of, of his choice. He read from Isaiah 61, verses 1 and 2. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me to preach good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners and recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. Then he sat down. Jews stood to read the text and then they sat down to expound on it. I think the Jews had at least one thing right. Somebody want to get me a chair? <laughs> he sits down and we're told that all eyes were fixed on him. And you can imagine the anticipation of the crowd based on their prejudice, based on their expectations. But instead, his sermon begins with this claim. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. What an amazing claim for Jesus to make. And you know what else? They understood it. They knew what Jesus was at, or claiming to be. They knew that he's claiming to be the Messiah, the long-awaited Savior. And it shocked them, I'm sure. Today, this scripture is fulfilled in your hearing. We read the crowd was amazed because they understand or understood exactly what Jesus boy, or Joseph's boy was claiming. It's interesting. In Mark's account of, of this incident, and that's found in Mark 6, 1 through 6, Mark also uses the word amazed. But he doesn't use it of the crowd. He uses it of Jesus. What amazed Jesus? <laughs> the unbelief, the ignorance, and the prejudice of the townsmen. That word amazed, used in two different texts about the same experience from two different perspectives. I, I find that quite interesting. Jesus is amazed, but not in a good way. The people are amazed, but they're anticipating things that they have no right to expect. You know, it's like, what is the Christmas thing? Dan uh, dreams of sugar plums dance in their heads or whatever it, whatever it says. <laughs> Jesus continued his sermon. He says, I tell you the truth. No prophet is accepted in his hometown. How to win friends and influence people, right? No prophet is accepted in his hometown. He says, I assure you that there were many widows in Israel in Elijah's time when the sky was shut for three and a half years and there was a severe famine throughout the land. Yet, he says, Elijah was not sent to any of them, but to a widow in Zarephath in the region of Sidon. In other words, he was sent to a foreigner. And there were many in Israel with leprosy at the time of Elisha the prophet, yet not one of them was cleansed, only Naaman the Syrian. I think Jesus is saying in effect here, look, you came here and you expected me to act like some trained seal, but your agenda and mine are completely, completely different. Why I came and why you received me are for two completely different, mutually exclusive reasons. You see, such reception is in reality a rejection of Christ. And their true colors soon became apparent. In verses 28 and 29 of Luke 4, 
We read, all the people in the synagogue were furious when they heard this. They got up, they drove him out of town, took him to a brow of the hill on which the town was built in order to throw him down the cliff. Now, as I've read, I've never been there, but the village of Nazareth was situated in a hollow surrounded on three sides by steep hills. And apparently they took him up one of those hills, apparently ready to push him off one and put him to death. Such a reception for Joseph's boy, huh? I don't know if you realize this or not, but Jesus did perform a miracle of sorts that day. You see, we cannot receive him on our own term, terms. We must receive him on his terms. They lead him out. They've laid hands on him. They're probably roughing him up a little bit. But when he gets to the top of the hill, to the precipice, we're told in verse 30, he walked right through the crowd and went on his way. They're manhandling him up the hill. And then it's like without so much as a word, he says, enough. Enough. In my own mind's eye, I picture him turning and facing the crowd, and they begin to get uncomfortable. In fact, they begin to back away from him. I think eyes went down. And Jesus, without so much as a word, began to walk away. He walked right through the crowd, and they parted and let him go. And I don't know if you're aware of this or not, but Jesus, when he walked away from Nazareth, probably never set foot in there again. As far as we can tell from the Gospels, he never set foot he never revisited Nazareth. You see, what a waste here. He had come to do what only he could do. He had come to fulfill the ministry in their midst that he was called to, to do. And they missed it. They took offense at the fact that Jesus or God had, had sent people to foreigners or healed foreigners and let people here in, in their own country go hungry, go, go sick. He didn't, he didn't force himself on the people. He will not force himself on you or me. If we reject him on his terms, the fact is we simply cannot receive him. It is true, as Luther said, I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ, my Lord, or come to him. The Holy Spirit has to do that work. And through word and sacrament, he accomplishes it. He would come to us, create life where it didn't exist, offer forgiveness that we don't deserve, make us his, and give us the hope of eternal life. Jesus made reference to the slogan, physician, heal thyself, in the context of the crowd demanding some proof from him as to the veracity of his claims. But I think it's clear from what he said that the question for us isn't physician, heal thyself, but physician, heal me. I need what you can provide, what only you can provide. You see, his terms are that we must receive him as Savior, for that's why he came. The Spirit of the Lord is on me, Jesus said, because he's anointed me to preach the good news to the poor. He sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners, recovery of sight for the blind, to release the oppressed, to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. We need to recognize ourselves as his word portrays us as spiritual paupers. In our natural selves, we are in bondage to sin and Satan. We are spiritually blind, yes, even dead. Only his word and the power of the Holy Spirit working through that word can he open our eyes and kindle within our hearts the faith needed 
to receive him properly. We receive him then through the gifts he gives to us of repentance and faith, where we would come and confess our sins to him, and we, by faith, would claim his provision for us. He works that in our hearts and enables us to work it out, if you will, to express it outwardly. To receive him improperly is, in effect, to reject him. To receive him properly is to receive all he is, all he's done, and all he offers to us, to you and to me. You see, Jesus has come to preach good news to the poor. This is the gospel. He has come to preach good news, news of forgiveness, news of good life, or new life, news of hope for eternity. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. He's come to to proclaim freedom for prisoners, freedom from the bondage to sin and Satan. And he said elsewhere in the Gospels, if the Son sets you free, then you will be free indeed. That's his promise to all of us. So also, Paul says in Galatians 4, when we were children, we were in slavery under the basic principles of the world. But when the time had fully come, God sent his son, born of a woman, born under the law, to redeem those under law that we might receive the full rights of sons. Think of that. And because you are sons, God sent forth the spirit of his son into our heart, the spirit that calls out Abba, Daddy, Father. So you're no longer a slave, but a son. And since you're a son, God has also made you an heir. Formerly, you did not know God. You were slaves to those who by nature are not gods, but now we can know him. It was for freedom, or it is for freedom, that Christ has set us free. He came to provide sight for the blind. I think of that song, Amazing Grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found. Was blind, but now I see. He came to provide release for the oppressed because he is the one who can conquer all our foes, sin, death, and even Satan himself. And it is true, that rhetorical question that Paul asks, if God is for us, who can be against us? He's come to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. This is a reference to the Jewish year of Jubilee. Israel had violated it. That was God's word to them, a word of failure um, in, in one of our Old Testament lessons. But he came to provide the true year of Jubilee, to set us free. And it is true for each of us then that because he has come, we can receive him. And because he has come as our savior, then we can be saved. And in receiving him by faith alone, the kingdom of heaven becomes ours. I know we're Lutherans, but can you say amen to that? Huh? What a remarkable thing. I'm forgiven. I'm set free. I've been given new eyes, the eyes of faith. I've become a child of God and a joint heir with Christ. I know the Lord's favor each and every day of my life. When we receive him according to his terms, all these blessings are ours. And we can celebrate Advent with unbounded joy. And may that be the case for each and every one of us here. Father, thank you for your word to us. Thank you that you sent your son. You were willing, Lord, to come to earth and you were willing to go the way of the cross, all for us. Thank you, Lord, that we can know the jubilee of our God. Thank you that we can know 
the good things that you provide for us. Thank you that we can share that good news with others. In Jesus' name, amen. Uh, rejoice, all ye believers. Stand as we close. speak louder. I'll oh. speak to my cheek. No, let's now. Just speak loud. <laughs> Just going to give you a hug. <laughs> Every year at Christmas time, I pass out a message uh, in, with our Christmas cards called the personal message of Christmas. I'd like to read it to you quick. If you like it, I've got copies in the back that you can include with your Christmas gifts, or you can, if you haven't sent all your Christmas uh, cards out, you can include them though in the, with your Christmas cards. Here it is, the personal message of Christmas. There's a very personal message of note in the Christmas message, which is frequently missed by many. The birth of Jesus is not simply an interesting fact of history, wholly unrelated to your present life, but rather the birth of Jesus has a direct bearing upon your life. When the angel announced the birth of Jesus to the shepherds, the personal importance of his coming was emphasized. The angel said, Fear not, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For unto you is born this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ Jesus the Lord. Have you ever thought that it was for you that Jesus was born? Do you realize that when he sent his son, into the world, he sent his son to be your savior. Jesus said he did not come to be the inspiration of sacred art, nor to be the theme of glad song, much less to be a merely good man and a great teacher. Jesus came to be the savior, and as such, he was born to you. Bound inseparably together are the savior's birth and his death. He came to save, and to save he must die. Die in the sinner's stead, 
bearing the full penalty of divine wrath for sin. And this too was personal, for it was for you. And such a very personal message of, the, of God's love and grace demands a personal response. The Savior who was born was God's gift to you. And he wants you to receive that gift. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes in God's Son will not perish, but have everlasting life. To receive the gift of God, by faith you must believe that Christ actually was born to be your Savior, and that he died for your sins. Because Jesus rose victorious over death, he offers you abundant everlasting life. Won't you receive the gift of God this Christmas? It can be your best Christmas yet. Thank you. I have copies of this in the back that you can receive. Okay, appreciate that. Um, I don't know who's in charge of, of the lunch, but should we pray now? That's a good idea? Okay, let's pray. Father, thank you for the opportunity to continue our fellowship together as we partake in a meal. We pray, Lord, your blessing on those who prepared the food, blessing on the food to our bodies that we might serve you. And we pray, Lord, that you would just bless our fellowship as we are drawn to our Savior during this time together. In Jesus' name, amen. Now, finally, receive the benediction. As you go on your way, may God go with you. May he go before you to show you the way. May he go behind you to encourage you. May he go beside you to befriend you, above you to watch over you, and within you to give you peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Thanks for coming. Thank you.